Welcome to the Onyx Report, a program that critically analyzes the experiences, histories, and perceptions of black males in American society. I'm Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Fresno State, black male advocate, and black male studies scholar. In the program, we examine current events while engaging concepts ranging from institutionalized anti-black misandry to gynocentrism from a black masculinist perspective. Our goal is to remind people of black men's humanity. Call in after a half hour to the show at 310-928-7733. All right. Welcome back to the Onyx Report. Uh, it's good to be back. Last night uh, had an emergency kind of show that, uh, if you didn't get a chance to catch, is still live on you. It's uh, is on YouTube under my channel there, uh, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. You'll find an interview with Dr. Lehman Basil, and uh, the whole conversation was about um, anti-black misandry and intimate partner violence when black men are the victims. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, interesting interview will definitely uh, catch you off guard um, if you haven't had a chance to see it. Um, now, you guys know what I usually like to do um, when I start is to kind of go over some of the major um, or not even major issues that are going on, but current events that I think are kind of worthy of some reflection, worthy of some importance, uh, worthy of your attention. Uh, so just and I name them at random. They're not listed in any order of importance, but they are important nonetheless. Um, first of which, I would suggest uh, you check out uh, an article on the, the appeal.org uh, about a family suing a Pittsburgh public school for handcuffing a seven-year-old. Um, this may be something that I will ask my guest about, but in general, just about the treatment of very young children in our school systems. Um, and this article definitely points in that direction. So again, that's at the appeal. Dot org uh, dealing with a Pittsburgh school and a family suing for the treatment of uh, their son. In the lawsuit, the boy's family said he was repeatedly suspended, secluded, and violently restrained before he was ever given a special education evaluation. This is apparently the seven-year-old boy in question. Um, and a lawsuit has been filed with the U.S. District Court last year um, and is worthy of some attention. So check that out. Also, in the news, we have um, a report that came out February 3rd on the New York Post dealing with an Atlanta woman who apparently killed her three-year-old boy for eating a cupcake. She told the police department that he had choked on the cupcake, but it became obvious to them that he'd actually um, died due to um, some straightforward um, blunt force trauma, uh, bruises on his legs, back, chest buttocks, arms, and head. Apparently, she had beat him with a baseball bat. Um, so check the uh, New York Post if you can stomach the story, but it's nonetheless indicative of what some of our children are grappling with. And again, we have to be able to have honest conversations about the kind of trauma our children experience. Uh, next up, is an interesting article considering the climate that we've been in in the last few years with um, Me Too, hashtag Me Too, hashtag Believe Her. Interesting article out by actress Ray Dong Chong, um, who is talking about having been seduced at the age of 15 by singer Mick Jagger. Um, interesting story out where she talked about having a fling with the musician in 1977 while he was still married and at the age of 33. Um, yet, I'm not quite sure if we'll see any five-part documentaries covering Mick Jagger's actions, but there definitely is room for that because apparently there's another article out uh, about how he apparently did have intercourse with a friend of his daughter who was 18, but he told her he'd been waiting for her since she was 10 years old. So this kind of dynamic when it comes to you know wealthy white men, they do tend to get called out publicly to some extent, but we never quite see it end up with either jail time or even a significant court appearance that that leads to significant jail time. Uh, but somehow when it comes to black men, even without evidence, the situation can be very different. Um, let's see. Next up, we have 
judge declaring a Texas man who served two years in prison for drugs actually innocent after investigation determines crooked cops lied. This is a February 5th article on Atlanta Black Star. Uh, definitely worth checking out. It's about Otis Mallet, who served two years in prison after he was arrested for selling drugs in 2008. His conviction was based on the word of former Houston Police Narcotics Department officer Gerald Goines, who claimed he saw Mallet selling drugs while he was working undercover. More than a decade after the saga began, the Harris County District Attorney's Office claims Goines lied about everything, according to the Houston Chronicle. So again, that's on Atlanta Black Star. Article came out February 5th. Give that a look if you can, uh, because these are the kinds of things that I think directly impact how we understand uh, black men, black boys, the experience that uh, we're having and the extent to which those experiences tend to be ignored, downplayed and dismissed on various levels. Um, now, we may not get into these articles directly, but we're definitely going to be dealing with these issues with my next guest, uh, who has been both an inspiration for me and also a very fierce and protective uh, friend and supporter, not only to me, but to brothers who have been doing this work in black male studies. Most especially, uh, we're talking about Miss Zakia Sankara Jabbar. Now, I would very much, uh, I'm going to actually, I was going to just kind of reorient it and just say, but I, I'm going to actually read the bio because, you know, I loved it, you know, and I, I wanted to get it across exactly the way it is. Uh, so Zakia Sankara Jabbar leads the movement for educational justice in the U.S. by advocating for black students and empowering black parents. Zakia's tenacious spirit, insatiable curiosity, and organizing acumen have, have elevated her from Ohio's leading voice eradicating educational inequalities to a national leading voice equipping black and brown parents with tools to drive sustainable change on a local level. Zakia came to organizing, advocacy, and policy work organically as a parent shining light on harmful school discipline policies that disproportionately impact black students and their families in Ohio, and now has worked in communities of all sizes across the country sharing tools, strategies, and her story for working class parents. She combined both her personal story, professional skills, and network to found and lead Racial Justice Now, an organization that exists to transform communities through organizing, advocacy, and sy systemic policy change. Zakia has received many national recognitions, and her work has been recently featured in the HBO series Problem Areas, and most recently on Adam Ruins Everything on True TV. Zakia also has the opening chapter in the critically acclaimed book Lift Us Up, Don't Push Us Out, voice from the front lines of the educational justice movement. When not organizing parents or advocating for black parents, students, and families, you'll find Zakia on conference stages across North America, equipping audiences with with her strategic frameworks for systemic change. Outside work, Zakia enjoys traveling and spending time with her husband and two children. Let's welcome uh, Zakia Sankara Jabbar to the Onyx Report. How you doing, sister? I'm, I'm well, how are you? Doing good, doing good. Now I do wanna point out that Zakia is the first guest I've had that has ever been a cartoon on television and still <laughs> wrecked it. I mean, I'm, I'm watching Adam Ruins Everything and I'm like, wait a minute. I know that voice. <laughs> that was tight. That was tight. Also, last thing to mention, she was actually uh, the first in the first annual online Africana Studies teleconference on black male studies at Fresno State. This was uh, March 27, 2017. You can also find that on YouTube. I invited uh, Zakia to join in via uh, uh, Zoom, and she gave a talk at that conference online. Uh, last year, oh, actually, I'm sorry, 2017, so a couple of years ago. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan nonetheless, and I definitely value her work. So, as usual, what I like to do is, you know, start from the beginning. So, if you if you could, you know, before we kind of get into the work you do, can you tell us a little bit about where you're from and what your upbringing has been? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to the show. I'm happy to be here to share with your audience. Um, so I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm an 80s baby. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and um, so I spent the first uh, several years of my life in Cleveland. So, you know, very early on, you know, some of my formative years uh, were in Cleveland. Um, 
But an interesting thing that uh, also happened uh, in the early 80s, as we know um, and reflect upon a lot in the social justice movement around criminal justice um, and also around um, um, just reflecting on the crack epidemic uh, in this country. And so that directly impacted my family. Um, you know, actually both of my parents end up uh, being impacted by that with, you know, my father uh, ended up being incarcerated uh, and my mother just, you know, end up not, you know, being in a position to, to really raise me, um, you know, or, or any other uh, children or whatever. So I actually ended up growing up in the rural South uh, in Beloit, Alabama, which is a small community right outside of Selma. Mm. Um, and it's very interesting because like when the movie Selma came out or like just, you know, in the last several years, we've been celebrating like 50th anniversaries around, you know, things around the civil rights movement. I remember growing up down there and it wasn't, at least from my perspective, like growing up, people didn't really talk about it, right? Like mm. people didn't talk about it being the seat of the civil rights movement. There was no, at that time, there was no monuments. There was no voting rights museum that's there now. So it's very interesting going back. Uh, I call Selma home, although I, I lived in, was born in Cleveland. Um, but going back home now is very interesting because there's so, you know, many monuments. There's, you know, all this history now that's erected, like you can actually see it. Uh, and when the movie came out, people were like, oh, that's where you're from, you know? And I remember mm. even as a child actually being ashamed sometimes of being wow. from a really small town in Alabama. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't very popular, you know? Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's a that's a little bit about uh, my upbringing. Um it was it was interesting to say the least. So it definitely uh, informed who I am today. A lot of it informed who I am today, for sure. Now, when did you when did you leave Alabama, and where did you go after that? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, so I was raised by my great grandparents and my great aunts and uncles. Uh, my great grandfather actually ended up uh, passing away. Uh, the summer I actually moved uh, to Selma, uh, my great grandmother rescued me, if you will, uh, from Cleveland mm. and um, my great aunts and uncles. So everybody that I grew up in the house with was 50 and older. I was five years uh, old. OK, yeah. OK. So people, it's funny because people have always called me like an old soul. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I just was never like a regular kid, like ever. Right, right, <laughs> you know? right. And so, um and uh, so anyway, um, my great grandparents, when my great grandmother passed away, I was going to the 11th grade uh, that summer. And uh, I ended up moving to Dayton, Ohio, which is where my uh, my other aunt, who was able to kind of like take care of me after my great grandmother passed away. And I finished high school in Dayton, attended college in Dayton and spent 20 years in Dayton until recently. Uh, now my, my family and I live in suburban Washington, DC. Uh, but I left Alabama and went back to Ohio, but went back to Dayton. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, you know, the Onyx Report is definitely much, fo definitely, you know, focused on the lives of black men and boys. Um, now, your work, you know, in education it has been very much tied to the improvement of the quality of education for black boys, you know, as well. Can you talk to us about where the the motivation came and the kind of you know the kind of work you initially started doing around the lives of, of black boys and how that kind of came about absolutely um you know as as my introduction stated it was rooted in my own experience i'm a mother mm -hmm. um my uh, first child is is a son, um, and I also have a daughter as well. So I have uh, two children. And when my son was three, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, I enrolled him into the preschool on the campus of the university I was attending at the time. Mm. And um, I wasn't very politicized then, right? I mean, you know, just regular everyday person, you know, I, I mean, I had an understanding, like I knew like racism was an issue, but did not have a very uh, deep intellectual analysis of how race really impacted every single institution, every single facet of, of our lives as black people in this country, anti-black racism specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I enrolled my son uh, in the in the preschool that's on the campus. And because they, they actually had a very good marketing program, like, you know, 
this place was like marketed as like the best option for kids, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, and so because, right, I'm thinking back to my own kind of like formative years, what was happening with myself when I was three, four and five years old, you know, just intuitively, I've always wanted my children to have better than what I had always. Mm. Mm. And so um, just naturally as a mother, I'm like, oh, this is the best option. You know, then he's going to the school is close to me. I'm on campus. I can just walk down and get him when it's time to go, you know, just looking at, you know, the things that was both convenient and both, you know, he would do well in the school. In Ohio, there's a test that kindergartners have to take um, before they enter kindergarten called the K-R-A-L or crawl test. Mm. And so how, part of how they marketed it was like, you know, we have preschool teachers who have bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and your child, you know, all the evidence shows that all of our kids who leave this preschool uh, score very well on the crawl test and they are kindergarten ready. Like that's literally on their marketing materials. Right. Mm. Um, and so I'm like, bet, you know, like shit, I, I believe in education, you know, I want right. my child to have this. Mm-hmm. And um, I immediately ran into roadblocks. Like when I went to register him, you know, so it became this really a class and race analysis at that time. Although I was working, I was working part time, had a government job. So, it was, you know, one of those good government jobs, but I was working part time because I was in school mm-hmm. uh, full time. And so my income uh, wasn't where it needed to be to be able to really support or for the full tuition of this preschool. But one of the things that uh, this particular preschool had in order to be on the campus of this university was an MOU that they allow a certain number of students, meaning Mm. that they have to work with us financially. I also, uh, because I'm very... um, you know, resourceful, uh, when applied for a federal program called Title 20, which is considered a federal subsidy or what some people may even call welfare. But I qualify for this federal subsidy called Title 20, and it's just a program that will cover tuition costs or child care costs for parents who are working and in school or pursuing higher education. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I bought my uh, approval letter, like to that school, there was this, I mean, the, the lady, older white lady, you know, was this very nasty, extremely rude, loud, like, oh, we only accept so many of these, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. just, it was extra. I was like, really? Mm-hmm. You know, um, <laughs> another personality trait that I have is like, I'm, that, that didn't deter me. Like I wasn't, I'm not easily deterred. I'm like, whatever, this is a good school. I'm getting my son in here. <laughs> not even thinking like, do you really want your son in this school? You know, I was not thinking at that time, like, you know, if exactly. this is the kind of, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. All I'm thinking about is they said this is a good school. That was my mindset at the time. And um, my baby wasn't in that school a week before they started calling me in class. <laughs> I'm sitting in class and they're calling. And, um, you know, some of the things that they're complaining about, is absolutely age appropriate for a three-year-old. Mm. Um, the other piece uh, that um, intuitively that I, I noticed is that in the child care settings that he had been in before, I had never had any issues ever. Mm. In fact, you know, the, the child care setting he was in before, they loved him. They were sorry to see us leave, you know, mm-hmm. but me as a mom, I'm thinking I'm, I'm making a good decision. He's closer to me on campus. He's going to score a plus on the crawl test. I'm okay. just giving you like what I'm right. thinking as a mom. Right. Um, at the, and also the other piece um, that's really important to this story was the school was about shit, 93% white. Mm. And again, I, I, I preface this conversation by saying, that I was not politicized at that time because okay. <laughs> that's important. I would never do that now. My kids, mm. even in suburban Washington, D.C., do not attend a school that's majority white. I would never okay. do that. Okay. Um, and part of that is because of that experience that I had there. The way that the white women, the teachers, the administrators, the reception, all of these people who was interacting with me and my son, were white women. Mm. And um just the language that they used about him. Like, I mean, literally a baby is three years old. Like, how can you use um, words like aggressive? Yeah. (laughs) You know, um, defiant even. Like, just the negative, the way they communicated with me as a parent. And so, 
just my own intuition, uh, instinctively, not even being politicized again, I pushed back. I, I did not buy any of it. Um, I organized other black women at that school, uh, especially those who had sons, because when I talk, and this is my story, I just want to make this clear, because when I talk to the mothers of uh, black daughters, they were not having the same issues. It was only those of us who had sons. Mm. Um, mm. And that, but 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 when you look at the research, uh, Hassan, uh, that's that's in line with what you see, particularly Absolutely. in preschool expulsions. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Dr. Walter Gilliam, who uh, is over at the Yale Child Study Center, he did the very first report, particularly looking at private preschools, because this school happened to be private, although they got some federal subsidies and got some government money, but they okay. were really a private school and. Um, and he looked at the data and analyzed it. I actually used his data uh, in my civil rights complaint. I went all the way with this school. I filed a, a complaint with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, who actually ended up telling me they didn't have purview and sent me to the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. And I filed a complaint with them. Mm. Uh, to say the least, uh, I found out, again, very quickly uh, that those kinds of processes are not quick. They literally take years. Yeah. Um, and so while I continue uh, that, I also continue to organize parents and eventually co-founded uh, Racial Justice Now with an explicit uh, focus on race and class, uh, mm -hmm. because most of the women that I organized were poor and working class uh, black women. Uh, and again, most of us having sons who were experiencing what we know as the preschool to prison pipeline. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So what what ended up happening as far as your son is, is concerned in that school? I took him out of that school. Uh, wow. I woke up. I'm leaving. I'm, it's, the story is so long. I'm leaving out a lot. But I'll tell you what I did. And I'll tell you who actually launched my political politicization, if you will, is Dr. Juwanza Kunjufu. I talk mm -hmm. about him in the opening mm -hmm. chapter of the book that you mentioned in my introduction. Mm -hmm. That that book countering the conspiracy to destroy black boys completely transformed how I looked at the world. Mm -hmm. Completely transformed how I viewed the world and how I viewed education. Absolutely. Because my education wasn't like that of my sons. And it's funny because now that I have a daughter who's younger, she's in kindergarten now, even her experience is different hmm. than what than that of my sons. Different um, in what way? Different insofar as, uh, so I will say, so the racial demographics in Washington, D.C. versus Dayton, Ohio is much different. So the preschool that she attended here in suburban D.C. Uh, did not have a bunch of white women as teachers, thank God. Um, okay, okay. There were mostly women of color, and mm. most of the students were also, um, you know, students of, of color. And um, so her experience you know, was different insofar as she wasn't pathologized the way that my son was immediately pathologized for normal childhood behavior right. for three to five years old. Absolutely. They would complain about him refusing to transition. And I remember I asked him, what the F was that? What, what are you talking about? Mm. Well, they would say, you know, um, he's on... We have stations, so they have stations in preschools and in a lot of schools or whatever. And so they're only supposed to stay on there 15 minutes and he wants to stay on longer. I said, mm -hmm. and I said, right. why are you calling me about this, man? Right. Like, right. if he wants to stay on it longer, let him. That's what he likes. That's what his interest is. Mm. The other piece um, that I would be remiss not to mention is also the increase um lessening of play-based learning in preschool and kindergarten. Mm -hmm. That has also disproportionately impacted um, black children, but particularly children who also have a more kinesthetic learning style exactly. and, children, and children who have a more experiential learning style, which is the kind of learning style till this day my son still has. Mm -hmm. My daughter actually has the same kind of learning style, but we don't get the same kind of calls about her that no. we would that we did about my, my son. Again, this is my lived experience. Sure. Um, because I just think that, you know, for my son, he was immediately just looked at even as a three-year-old child by these white female teachers as a threat even. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it, it dumbfounded me until I read Kajufu's book. Eventually I obviously have studied a lot more and have read a lot more Gloria Lassen Billings 
uh, Dr. Ivy Tolson, like all of these other scholars, particularly in education, um, Asa Hilliard, oh my God, Joyce mm-hmm. King, all these folks who have written about how to educate black children, how to educate uh, black students, um, has really propelled the way that I organize in communities of color, particularly black parents, particularly black folks, and the kinds of questions they need to be asking educators and principals um, in their in their schools. I also work with national teachers unions and I challenge them, you know, don't you know, when they invite me to speak, I challenge them often about the policies and practices and sort of the environment that they create uh, as it relates to black families and black children. Now, I had some something similar happen as well with my son. Mm -hmm. When he started kindergarten, it was within the first three or four days that they tried to put him into special education. Um, And and because, you know, I, you know, as a professor, I teach for a couple of days and then I usually write from home. So I have the time to walk up in the classroom in the middle of the day. And, 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 you know, a lot of parents didn't have that, that the, the capacity to do that, but I would go in and the, you know, you, the teachers would definitely look surprised when I walk in and I just sit there and watch. And even as, as young as in kindergarten, I noticed, you know, cause we were in a, a district that of course was predominantly white, but it was becoming more and more diverse because people were moving into the area and renting. So they weren't necessarily, you know, buying the property, but they were renting. Right, so you right. could see in a very short period of time, the teachers were still lily white, but all the students were becoming more and more diverse and they didn't know how to deal with it. So, yep. you know, I would come in and watch how they would do it. And you're right. They would complain about basic things, but more to the mm-hmm. point, they would complain about things that the white kids would do while I was sitting yes. there. And they would not call the parents for that, but I'd be sitting there nope. watching it. And really, I could say by the second grade, my son was the only black male in the class. There were there was one other black female, if I'm not mistaken. But they put him in the back of the room, segregated from the entire class for a whole semester at one point. Now, mind you, this is a kid who was reading 700 page books in the first grade. Mm hmm. So, you know, you, you, you got a first grader reading 700 page books and you're telling me that he needs to be in special education. And simply because I refused it and I forced them to do their jobs and I was in their face and I was in the principal's faces, you know, it, it, he, he ended up being in like the top three for the next four or five years in his class. Yeah. At, you know, but that type of advocate, you know, it, it usually requires, you know, the, the level of, of being an advocate that sometimes a lot of people have difficulty doing with, you know, carrying all the load that they need to carry. But I'd like to know, you know, you mentioned developing racial justice now. Tell us about that transition from being a parent organizer to setting up an organization. What did it take? And and what does, you know, tell us about the work your organization does. Oh, wow. So I never uh, made the transition. I'm still an organizer, right? Okay. Um, but when it comes to... Uh, Lord, I'm trying to figure out what I want to say publicly, but anyway, (laughs) seriously, man, when it comes to running an organization, um, well, I'll I'll say this, uh, I've reflected a lot on other organizers from history uh, that I respect, uh, that I love. I think about Ella Baker, I think about Ida B. Wells, I think about other powerhouse black women who were unapologetic. I think about even Winnie Mandela, right? South Africa, Azania. And I'm just like, you know, everything is professionalized when it comes to organizing now, if you want to be resourced to do it. So let me make that clear. Okay. Uh, so developing racial justice now has required a lot of being more professional in so far as I'm on conference stages. I am having to learn. I have learned fundraising, what that takes, developing relationships with the right people, because uh, we know that black people don't own and control any wealth in this country. So we know that developing relationships with certain people uh, can be challenging uh, because we don't have that. At least I speak for myself, nobody uh, that I grew up around or myself or anybody that actually organizes in communities has that proximity to any kind of wealth in any meaningful way to support mm. the work that we do. Okay. Um, so it's actually taken me away from the ground. 
if, if that makes sense. It's taken me away from really doing what I love each and every day. Because as you said, I mean, you're a professor, so you, you have a full-time job, but your full-time job is flexible. Mm-hmm. My full-time job is organized. Mm-hmm. And since... Um, and since that is professionalized now, there's an entire infrastructure that's called the nonprofit industrial complex. Mm. And that infrastructure is what I'm involved in when it comes to operating an organization. So in some ways, um, I've had to be extremely creative uh, mm. to be able to do what it is that my heart desires to do what it is um, that I know that my community needs and deserves. Um, so I would say that it's taken um, a very heavy uh, spiritual and emotional toll to be able to learn how to creatively balance my desires uh, and my love for black people and also uh, doing what I have to do right to resource the movement, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, if, yeah. you, if, if you could very briefly break down the nonprofit uh, industrial complex, can you explain what that is? So uh, there is so the nonprofit industrial complex or NGOs, non-governmental you know organizations or whatever. That's what they're known as, like in other countries. These are organizations that you know some of them are hospitals, uh, some of them are schools. Like they are social justice or they're doing some kind of uh, service uh, uh, for communities. And so there is an infrastructure where usually it's, uh, funding comes from foundations. Right. So I can name, you know, there's several foundations who may be interested in education, right, Mm -hmm. interested in funding um, education advocacy. They're not many. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. They're not many. Mm -hmm. Um, So many folks uh, in our movement um, and not just speaking for myself and racial justice now, but I'm a part of a national network, right, of other folks who are doing the same thing. And so a lot of people have had to what's called diversify how they fund their work. Um, You know, we live in a digital age, so folks are doing podcasts, right? You know, Mm -hmm. getting followers on YouTube. Um, Mm -hmm. I just found out about that from my son like a couple years ago. Like, like, mommy, can I set up a YouTube page? People get paid. I was like, really? Wow. Wow. (laughs) I I learned about it when you did, too. (laughs) Right. So, um, you know, people, and then also individual donors. So, like, now... The bigger nonprofits who are doing similar work that I'm doing have relationships with like Colin Kaepernick. So like uh, I knew some of the organizations that Colin Kaepernick gave money to. Like that was in the news. Like Colin was giving out, you know, funding to organizations doing work on prison reform, criminal justice, you know, schools, you know, all of those different kind of things. He was funding black led stuff, which was amazing. I, I was hoping like that caught fire with like other, mm. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Black folks with money. So um, so basically, all in all, it's a professionalized uh, mechanism uh, for social justice movements. Uh, not just social justice, because hospitals are sometimes designated as nonprofits as well. But um, in what I am describing when it comes to like the social justice movement, uh, the nonprofit industrial complex is the professionalized mechanism that Many people, and I'm going to be honest with you, some of my colleagues who are even closer to the ground, even than I am now, call gatekeepers. Some Mm -hmm. of them see the nonprofit industrial complex as hoarders of resources and gatekeepers from actually getting the actual work of what the desires of the community wants. Because I want to be really clear, Mm -hmm. Um, the desires of the community oftentimes does not match up with what certain foundations want. Mm. And so I'll, I'll leave it there. So the funding determines the, the what they tend to expend much of their energy on, even if it goes against yeah. what the community itself is looking for. That's, that's an issue. Right. Mm-hmm. So okay. I, think, I think many people who are honest about this work will tell you that. Yes. Now, your organization, is, is there an age range in terms of the, 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 the different levels of education you guys deal with? Or how does how does racial justice now step in on the situation? We particularly, so yeah, so there is pre-K uh, through 12. We specifically focus on, we don't do any work on co- collegiate. Not saying that that's not something that may be in the future, but mm-hmm. we're 
focus on grade school, middle school, and high school, and organizing and advocating and pushing for policy changes uh, as it relates to black students uh, in those institutions. We also uh, support uh, independent black institutions. We're totally for that, completely for independent, especially African-centered uh, education, African-centered uh, I- institutions uh, who are teaching black children. Now, is that what you put your son in? Is that where he transitioned into? He did for a while. So when we made the transition from Ohio uh, to uh, suburban Washington, D.C., uh, he was in an African-centered institution, Aya Education Institute, shout out to them in Atlanta, Georgia, um, had an online component, uh, but he was enrolled with them uh, for a period of time. And now uh, where we live at, uh, in the community that we live in, I'm happy uh, with the school system that he's in. Um, mm. It has, you know, it's, no school system in this country is perfect, right? None of the institutions, uh, especially the ones that we don't control, it's a public education system. So, um, but like you, right, I am a very involved parent. In fact, um, <laughs> It's funny because his principal uh, Googled me and all this stuff came up, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, That's that. right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and the way that they treat me and him and even for my daughter is completely different. Um, you know, and I and I never go to the school with that kind of like chip, if you will. Like I, I, I'm always very cordial because I understand that if I'm going to put my kids in the system, um, the kind of power that they have because I'm not with them every day, right? While they're while they're in school, so I'm I'm also uh, very keen on having positive relationships with the teachers and the uh, administration of the school because that is very critical. And I teach that uh, to parents. You know, when when we're organizing and, and and having these meetings, you know, that's one of the tools that I tell parents that's really invaluable is creating an authentic relationship. With, with your with your child's teacher. Mm. Sometimes it's not possible. Uh, and when it's not possible, that's when you up the ante, if you will. You, 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 you learn the structure of the school. You learn the structure of the school district. You learn who has what. You do a power analysis and you begin to do your target based on that and do your advocacy based on who has the power to make the changes you want. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I- at the beginning of, of the show, when I covered current events, the first one I talked about was the Pittsburgh seven-year-old boy who was handcuffed. Have you dealt with, you know, advocating for kids who are being uh, really treated like they're in a police state, depending on the type of school they're in? Has that been an issue that's come up oh, in your work? I, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in Dayton, as a matter of fact, there was a um, there was a huge issue with a fourth grader uh, being handcuffed at the same school that my son was attending at the time. We did a, uh, we did a, a whole campaign around that mm. um, and uh, called out the school board members who wanted to, you know, pussyfoot around and not do anything about it. Um, we, we went hard against the school, uh, the school board and uh, the, the school um, for handcuffing that child uh, because number one, it traumatized not just that child, but it traumatized the other kids in the class because they witnessed it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and just kind of criminalization of young children. Mm-hmm. Um, and it usually targets black children, particularly black boys. There's this need for this immediate social control. It's like mm-hmm. there's, they see them as this like beast or something like that just needs Absolutely. to be controlled no matter how young they are. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we're very unapologetic in our advocacy. In mm-hmm. fact, um, I remember, you know, we we also do very creative things when it comes to like online campaigns. And, you know, uh, we did a good job of getting media coverage as well. Had a very good relationship with the education reporter at Dave Daily News. And, um, and so we did a really good job of uh, creating this. Uh, we, we, so what we did was, <laughs> people still talk about this. It's hilarious. Uh, all the school board members who voted um, no on uh, changing the policy of handcuffing young children. All we were asking them to do was like change the policy. This is ridiculous, right? You shouldn't be handcuffing children that young. Um, 
we we made memes of them and put their faces in handcuffs, like you know, and mm. and called them publicly to the to the entire community because in Dayton, thankfully, we have an elected school board. So we wanted to let the community know these are the people who think your five year old, your seven year old, right, your eight year old, mm-hmm. your nine year old needs to be handcuffed in school, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. And I remember how the school board president, who was an African-American, he's actually a good friend of ours. He was actually a friend of the family. And um, we, I hate we had to do that to him because I'm like, this is about the kids. You know, this is not about politics, right? We have to, you know, do what we have to do. And I remember he contacted us. He was like very hurt by that. And I said, well, we're very hurt that you voted not to change the policy. I don't know who's in your ear. But mm-hmm. here's the thing. I, know who, I, I have to say this. I knew who was in his ear. I have to say this, one of the biggest opponents to families in local communities when it comes to organizing to change policies and practices that harm our children are local teachers unions. Mm. Are mm. mainly hit up by their white female members. Okay, okay, okay. And that was who was in his ear. And I had to remind him, I said, look, man, they don't live in Dayton. They drive in from the suburbs. You mm. are elected by people who live in the city of Dayton. Mm. The kids, the families who live in the city of Dayton send their kids to Dayton public schools. So you need to be listening to us, not them. Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, it, I'm curious, what have you been finding in terms of, you know, especially with black boys, uh, in terms of how they're matriculating, how they're graduating, what have you, what have you been finding over the years, and is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What are you seeing? Hmm. It's um, you know, this is a question that sometimes keeps me up at night, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, when I look at the data uh, in Ohio, when I look at the data of national trends, Ohio, according to a Shot Foundation report, this report. I think came out in 2015. So, you know, the data, of course, is dated. But I will never forget how it made me feel when I read it. Ohio was in the top 10 um, or bottom 10, however you want to call it, uh, having the lowest graduation rates for black male students Mm. in the country. Mm. I'm talking about like down there with like (laughs) people from Mississippi probably go get mad at me, but like Mm. Mississippi. You know, like the right. states that you usually hear, like that's just, just at the bottom of education, just forever. But mm-hmm. um, but when I looked at the data, you know, because the good thing about the Ohio Department of Education is they actually do, do a pretty good job of collecting data, and they collect okay. it in a disaggregated way. So race, gender, they even do migrant status, they do socioeconomic. Wow. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. And uh, my co-founder, Professor uh, Vanilla Randall, um, who's now emeritus. Um, uh, from the University of Dayton School of Law, I remember she disaggregated the data. And one of the things that we found was that um, black male students were constantly being targeted, particularly black male and also identified with the disability. So back mm-hmm. to this whole special education issue, the catch-all for black male students in Ohio I haven't looked at the data, the data for D.C. or Maryland yet, which is where I'm, I live now. Um, but the data for Ohio, the number one uh, student to be kicked out of school was black male and identified as having um, uh, a disability. And so the uh-huh. disability y'all, was always this oppositional defiant. That these kids were always labeled as oppositional defiant, which is very subjective. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. always encourage parents when when they have when they have come to me for advocacy after their child has been labeled. I've always encouraged them to get a second opinion, mm-hmm. to take their child to a culturally competent therapist, right? Mm. Um, who can take another look because it doesn't hurt. Um, And nine times out of 10, I'm going to say it, man, nine times out of 10, that child was mislabeled and misdiagnosed. Just like how you advocate and like for your child, because um, I just think like sometimes parents don't have the utility and we give this sort of, uh, we we usually just believe the teachers like, oh, they're the professionals. Or we believe, oh, they're the professionals. No, you're the professional on your child. (laughs) Right. That's what I said. No, you are the professional when it comes to your child. So I always tell parents to go with their gut because that's what I did. 
again, I went with my gut, like this isn't right. Something about the way that you all are describing my child is not right. And I've never heard it before. Right. Right. That's the other thing. Um, I'll say like, well, does your child exhibit similar behavior in other settings? Mm. And not, a lot of times they're like, no, nah, nobody complains. Mm. And I'm just like, question that, sis. Like, question it. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, that, just, that, that, that was... That was definitely something, you know, again, my son and I experienced. As a matter of fact, you know, it, it would even happen at the daycare level. If I yes. took him to predominantly white daycares, you know, he yep. was always in trouble. And eventually I put him in a, a daycare that was uh, partially run by, you know, a family in the Nation of Islam. And yeah. I didn't get one phone call after that. You know, exactly. they, you know, they were like, no, we got him. But the thing was about it is, you know, at the end of the day, you're talking about, you know, a group of people that saw his humanity. But, That's you know, the kinds of teachers that I'm seeing, you know, haven't been around black kids at all. As a matter of fact, one of the things I noticed, you know, at the kindergarten level especially is, you know, these white teachers, they, you know, even on a, even on a, well, some of it was purposeful, but some of it was even self uh, subconscious in that they would give what I call tactile approval to, to white kids. And then they would just kind of give verbal approval to black kids and, and the brown kids. Yeah. So, so, you know, they would say across the room, oh, you did a good job. But for other white kids, they would get up out of their chair and go pat, pat the child on the head or whatever. And you're talking about five-year-olds. You know right. What I mean? So they respond to that, but they can't always articulate that. So when you ask your child how was school, what happened, they don't always have the vocabulary to break down those kinds of nuances, but they have an effect. You know what I That's mean? Right. And, and if we're talking about a K through 12 system that is what, 70 percent white women teachers. Oh, man, um, it's higher than that. Is it is it higher now? What's what's oh, it up yeah. to now? 70% white 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 teachers. Oh no, it's it's about 80. <laughs> white women yeah. teachers. Oh yeah. Okay. It's crazy. So we're uh -huh. up to about 80. But even mm -hmm. then, if you're talking about boys, because there's some research data that suggests that boys tend to do better and perform better under male teachers, girls tend to do better and perform better under female teachers. What does that say? Kanjufu. When Kanjufu talks about that too. Right. But so what does that say when just the white women alone are as you as you say at around eighty percent? You know what I mean? What what does that say as far as where black boys end up and what can happen? You know, uh, those are those are the kind of this questions. This has been that a problem. Oh man, this has been a problem and it didn't just start with my son. Kajufu, I believe, wrote the first uh the first um edition of that book in the eighties. Yeah. And literally in twenty eleven it was the same thing. But I sure. think about my husband's story. You know, my husband and I do this work together and um he like him starting to work with me actually caused him re to reflect on his own education, like yeah. K through twelve. Yeah. And he could remember like being completely disinterested, you know, uh, in, 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 in the curriculum and what the teachers was talking about, like, you know, and just his experience, um, you know, with, with education and, and, uh, and, and thinking about like how even now, like the same kinds of experiences are continuing generation, <laughs> right. After generation of, uh, uh, experiences, I think it's, um, I think, this, again, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night sometimes. It's one of the things that motivates me to continue to fight harder and continue to motivate others to get into this fight. You know, our children's minds are literally being shaped in these classrooms, uh, in these schools, for because the vast majority of us are sending our kids to these institutions, right? Mm -hmm. um, our kids' spirits are being just decimated, man. Mm. I think about... I think about, uh, you know, my, my co-founder, she shared a story with me about how she didn't find out because she has two black male sons. She didn't find out that, you know, her sons had received so much psychological trauma until they were adults. They didn't share it with her, mm. um, you know, and they were in, you know, pretty, you know, in a wealthy white neighborhood. So in pretty, you know, all white schools. And so. I just don't think we can underestimate. I think we need more advocacy and let us instead of less advocacy. I'm a huge proponent of independent African centered schools. Mm -hmm. uh, the research uh, is just too strong. I, I'm, you know, my my goal one day is to eventually start a school. If I could ever gather enough resources mm -hmm. uh, 
it's to start a school for black families, you know. Um, well, what do you what, what what do you say as far as homeschooling? What, what has been your your experience or whatnot as far as that? Uh, as, so as there as is a that's a, there's a powerful uh, homeschooling collective uh, in the D.C. area. Uh, the Sankofa Collective, shout out to them. Uh, Sister Monica Utsi is amazing. A bunch of sisters um, run that collective. And I think that works well for some people. Um, the vast majority of our folks, and I'm thinking about like the folks that I organize who are mostly poor working class black women. These are, you know, black women and black families who are economically at the margin. So they're working uh, service industry jobs. So like jobs that number one, don't have any union protections. Um, they're like waitress kind of like jobs or jobs that are back breaking, like, like nursing assistants or LPNs where they're, um, again, no union protections, none of those kinds of things. So you call off too many times or, you know, mm -hmm. have right. too many, you know what I mean? It's right. a wrap. And right. so you literally have families who are already barely, you know, paying their rent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, keeping food on the table. And so homeschooling is just unfortunately not an option for a lot of our families, you know, uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to, you know, economics, a lot of us, it's just not. And so that's why for me personally, and I get attacked by some Pan-Africans and, you know, other folks who are just, you know, no, nah, we need to just get our kids out of these damn systems. I'm with you. I'm right. with you. But right. until we get there, you feel me? We no, have absolutely. to hold these institutions. <laughs> we have to hold these institutions uh, accountable because guess what? We're paying taxes. <laughs> exactly. exactly. We're paying taxes to these schools. Schools in this country are funded by property taxes. So, I think we have a responsibility uh, to hold them to account. And there are places where that has been done well. I think mm -hmm. that we have done a decent job in Dayton, Ohio. It's a small, rugged mid Midwest town, but we have done a decent job of holding that particular school district accountable to black children and black families. We were able to get that school district uh, in 2017 to create the third office of, it's called the Office of Males of Color, but it's only the third office that's just completely dedicated um, to the educational uh, achievement of, of um, uh, black students, black male students. Wow. We were Where? able to do that by using data. The first office is right there out there by you uh, in Oakland, Brother Chris Chapman, um, okay. who I consulted uh, and who the Dayton Public Schools consulted before they created uh, the Office of Males of Color in Dayton City Schools. Uh, we consulted the Oakland Unified School District, which was the first in the nation to create the Office of African American Male Achievement. Brother Chris is amazing. He's done an amazing job. They've since created the Office of African American Female Achievement and have now created, I believe, the Office for uh, Pacific Islanders and all the other uh, minority groups uh, who reside in the school district and created specific, um, you know, tan uh, tangible sort of um, curriculum and things that that particularly uh, speak to the cultures of those particular communities, which I think is absolutely what's needed all across this country. Seattle now has an office of African American male achievement, and so does Minneapolis. So it's catching on across okay. the country because, as you asked me, the graduation rates, I mean, it was dismal, a mm. complete dismal because mm -hmm. our black male students were just, I didn't think they were dropping out. I call it push out. They were being Absolutely. pushed out of school, man, Absolutely. from day one. Yeah, because in, in California, about, what, 70% of the boys are effectively illiterate, black boys in particular, right? And and that's and the kind that of environment we're talking about. Failure. It's, it is unacceptable, man. Absolutely. And that's why I'm that's why I advocate so much because I'm like, we need more people outraged about this. That's unacceptable. Well, it, and it's and it's not over. That's an I, underclass. It's creating an entire un underclass. No, it absolutely is, and and that's why you know I talk about this. I'm at I teach at the Cal State level, but right. I mean, seventy percent of black males in the Cal State system drop out in their first year. So you, when you look at it, going from K through twelve to college. There's, right. You know, there's a consistent stream there that we nobody really wants to deal with. But no. in, the, in the last couple of minutes we have, you know, what are some of the solutions that you can that you often go over with parents uh, as far as working with kids and navigating these environments? Again, especially in regard to black boys, 
What are the kind of solutions you suggest to parents who are wondering what they can do and how to navigate it? Number one, <laughs> excuse me, affirm, affirm, affirm. I will never forget one time. Um, and then you got to find balance because mm. I've struggled with finding balance with, you know, number one, disciplining my son, uh, you know, when he needs it. Right. But but trying to find the balance of not um, how do I say this? So um, because I also don't want to cripple him. You understand mm. what I'm saying? Like, I don't want mm-hmm. to be so overprotective and like, you know, and cripple him because that's also not good. So one of the things that I've struggled to do and, and I'm, I'm still perfecting it. Right. Um, you know, he's doing well, by the way, I, I wanted to mention, um, you know, he's a very bright young man. And one of the mm-hmm. things that Kajufu talks about in his book, instead of, you know, describing, uh, you know, young men as being aggressive or, you know, not wanting to listen, they actually have leadership skills, right? <laughs> like right. he's a leader. Like, Mm -hmm. why don't you lean into that as an educator and uh, allow him to be your teaching assistant? Like he he maps it all out in his book. So I actually use a lot of the tools and strategies, um, very practical stuff that Kajufu included in his book um, to share with other parents for folks who don't have access to his book or probably would never read it. So I use a lot of that. He's incredibly detailed. He gets down to the ideal ideal temperature temperature in the classroom for boys. Everything. He's deep. He's amazing. He's amazing. So I actually use a lot of tools. But back to um, this experience I wanted to share in his last few minutes. I remember one time the white female teacher had called. They called me to the school. My son, I think, was in third grade then at that time. And uh, I went to the school, but I was angry because I had to leave work. And I was like, damn it, you know, there's something else going on. And I remember, you know, I got there and I pulled him out of the classroom. I asked him to come here and so he could see my face so he knew I was angry and when he came out of the classroom he just broke down Mm. he just began to cry and I said wait a minute I said what's wrong you know and he was just like you know mommy I'm trying but and and explain to me what what was actually happening in the classroom and the dynamics with the teacher that's Mm -hmm. all he had to say Mm -hmm. and 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 that moment I was like, you got to find balance, Zakia. You got to affirm this child. Let him know, you know, that you, number one, you're going to have his back regardless. Children mm-hmm. need to know that. I'm sorry. Some people disagree with that. But when they're that young and you're putting them in a system that we know is already adverse to them, they have to know that you will have their back. I tell parents to believe their children. There's There's been an upbringing that some kind of, you know, there's a lot of black people that socialize to believe teachers mm-hmm. <laughs> over sure. their kids. Mm-hmm. And so I I actually argue against that. I said, you know, I think you need to use your own intuition, but if your child tells you something happened, you know, you know your child, right? So you, you should, at least me, I, I know my child. I, I can ascertain pretty much when he's lying. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And usually get it out of him if he's lying. Like he'll eventually break down and say, okay, mommy, I lied or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to get that teacher together because what I was noticing was that his spirit was being broke down. You know what I mean? And so I can't contribute to that by allowing what the teacher's narrative is, right, to contribute to his spirit being, um, you know, broken down in that situation. So I use a lot of my own experiences to inform, particularly, like you said, of parents of black boys who are going through similar things. It Mm -hmm. never fails me that when I talk to a parent of a, of a black male child, they have similar experiences, just like you. Yeah. I, yeah. I had never heard your story before, but they have very similar experiences um, with their children uh, in these schools. And so I think that just basically making sure parents affirm, 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 like before they leave, let them know that you love them. Let them know that they're brilliant. Tell them that they're smart. They have to know that they can go into this school and do what they have to do and and do well and encourage them. Um, the other piece is that I mentioned earlier is also you have to be the number one person, the number one advocate for your child. You be the one to reach out to the teacher. I get all of my kids' teachers' emails at the beginning of the year. Period. Exactly. There's no exception. You exactly. have a right to that information. I need your email, and I can I keep in contact once a week. It's a full time job. So parents, 
I tell them like it's a sacrifice on your time. You but know what I mean? Yeah, but it, it has to be done. Was, it has to be done, brother. Yeah. Well, let me let me let me thank you for coming on the Onyx Report. And if you can, you know, briefly tell us, tell people out there how they can reach you, how they can reach Racial Justice Now, uh, if they want to find out new ways to advocate and support their own uh, children in their own communities. Absolutely. So, um, Racial Justice Now, you can go to www.rjnohio.org. Um, you can reach me on Twitter at uh, Zakia Shinyere. That's Z A K I Y A C H I N Y E R E. I'm on Facebook, just Zakia Sankara Jabbar. You can reach me there. And I'm also on Instagram, and it's just Zakia Sankara Jabbar, no dashes. Um, so, yeah, I'm on all three of those uh, social media platforms. You can reach me there. Um, and you can also just go to the website for more information as well. Well, beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you for coming on. And and, uh, and I want to say to the listeners, thank you for supporting the Onyx Report. And remember, I'm here to tell, especially black men, uh, remind them, really, that we are not criminals by birth. We're not perennial rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support sources, su- success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery tickets, unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, unpaid repairmen, workhorses, or any other socially accepted dehumanizing stereotype. We're thinkers, inventors, innovators, leaders, fathers, and men. Embrace your humanity, know your worth, and expend, extend your time, attention, and resources only to those that genuinely respect you. And I and I, I focus that also on the young boys uh, in the environments they're in. They are being taught, taught by people that believe these stereotypes about males. So you have to go the extra step in humanizing your children. Thank you again, and I will see you all next week uh, on the Onyx Report live on YouTube. Uh, I'm always on Wednesdays at 5 o'clock Pacific time, uh, first and third Wednesdays on Interlight Radio, second and fourth Wednesdays on my live YouTube channel. Uh, See you next week. Peace.